so I can tell those of you who are listening to me, do the study, do it in details, and find out what each of these things mean. So they're not people. They're not gods walking around with animal heads. Those are metaphorical representation of ideas, principles, and concepts. Let me say that again. Osiris walking around as a mummy, being dead. There's no dead dude walking around with his dicks pointing out. Um, that's a symbol of, of, a, of a concept and a principle that is alive in every human being. Osiris is every human being. A set is every female human being. You understand? The, the children, their children are their qualities and attributes. Anubis, Haru, and so forth. These are the quality and attributes of what every human being is capable of expressing. So let's, let's go on. Um, this, the Per M. Haru, the book of the coming forth by day, or what the whites call the Egyptian book of the dead. This is chapter 17. And I just I put this in because I wanted to show, you know, I'm in Prince Hall Masons. People always jump and say, oh, the Masons, this and this. Stop listening to the, your ideas about white masonry that you've learned from white folks who hate white masonry. Go do your own research and find out what masonry is all about and where did it come from. And this symbol right here with the lion, uh, a leopard facing in different directions, this is just the concept that symbolized yesterday and tomorrow. And the light in the center, Ra, represents today. You know, just, and th that symbol is at the center of the Freemasonic teachings, which come out of Kemet, not out of England, not out of France, not out of the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars and them steal this body of information from us and bring it back to Europe and repackage it like they've done Christianity, Judaism, and other things. This I put up, the Book of the Coming Forth by Day, is very important to see this little piece here. There's a lot in this papyrus. It's a fantastic papyrus. It has so much in it. But the little piece I was concerned with was to show you Brother, this is the papyrus of, An, uh, papyrus of Ani. Brother Ani has passed away. This is his soul, his ba, being uh, watching his spirit being weighed. This is the feather of Ma'at, the feather of truth. This is his heart being weighed. His heart meaning his deeds, how he lived, how he spoke, how he acted, how he behaved on this earth. Being weighed, the energy that that has produced is what is being weighed against a feather. And that feather had better be lighter, mean heavier, than the, at, the energy that you produce on this earth. Because if you produce negative energy, it will be weighty. If you produce good energy, good character, good behavior, it would be light. And so you have Anubis, the, the, uh, the human body, and the jackal, the dog head. Now, there was no man in ancient Kemet that had a dog head. This is a symbol because the, the jackal was a dog that represents judgment. I mean, he would bury his meats in the ground and stuff and let it rot until it got just tender enough for him to go and dig up and eat and, and digest so it would do him some good. So he was referred to as the greatest symbol of judgment. So that's why he's using as the judge of the character of this man. And so here we've got this other person keeping a record, Tahuti. There's no person in the ancient came up with no bird head. There's a bird called the Ibis bird. And that bird, as it searched for worms in the marshland, it looks like it was writing. It leaves, if you see it today, it looks like, they like they're writing a whole letter. So it became the symbol of how we carry on calligraphy or writing. And so the, the, the human is recording the result of this man's character being judged against the principles that the society calls ma'at. That is the standard by which everybody should behave. You see, um, and looking at this and then listening to you, my brother, mm -hmm. we as African people, we look towards nature to give us the answer to things. We also right. look at the signs of the animals that yeah, we, that, right. we learn from we, about we, the animals and we watch them. Right. You know? Na nature is not our enemy. That's the white man is at war with nature. The African is a part of nature. And that's why the white man is at war with the African. Nature is... And the cosmos is our dictionary, our encyclopedia, our Bible, our holy book. 
we imitate it because it is the perfection of creation so that we can be in tune with that perfectional function. And what the whites did, they would steal, and then this guy I got here, the hippopotamus, the lion, and the crocodile. Well, if you were on the bad side of things, you went here. This is probably what the white man calls hell, you know, in his, his literature. And, and, but I'm calling him now the district attorney. And I'm calling this brother the court recorder. And I'm calling this brother uh, the judge. And I'm calling, you know, the brother who's bringing Mr. Ani through his attorney. And what we're seeing up here is the 12 jurors sitting in judgment. And then what we see in the laws of Ma'at here is the laws by which people are being judged. So what I'm saying is that this is the American and the Western legal system stolen right from one page of our book. And they don't even give us credit for it. And it's right in front of our face and we can't see it. They use our scale of justice. They use our lady Ma'at as justice. They use her bandana from around her head to put over her eyes. And, and we still don't get it. They've taken our whole system and make us think we don't have nothing. And they've got this great democracy and this great legal apparatus that we need to learn from when it's nothing but a fragment from the periphery of your system. The Coffin Text is the third oldest written holy book. Again, this is us. And I wanted people to be clear. Here the priest and the priestess, and they just black as they can be. So, Professor you know? Smalls, I'm sorry to keep cutting you off, but I want to yes, give sir. our people a good and clear sight. Mm -hmm. Where were the Hebrews? There, the they, there was no such thing. They don't Where were the Moors? They, the there's no such thing. There was no Christianity, there's no Moors, there's no Hebrews, there's no Islam, there's none of this stuff. No, not, this no not at this time. That's why I'm saying Judaism, Christianity, and Islam is fragments from the periphery of this practice that we had going on hundreds of thousands of years before they stumble so on the scene. The Hebrews was not in Kemet? They was not in Egypt? They, they, they're nowhere in our history. They're nowhere to be found. And we have the best kept history in the world to date. And the best preserved history in the world to date. And how would we not preserve something as extraordinary as the event they claim took place? So I try not to give too much credence to it other than to say that these people stole fragments from the periphery of this system. You see the priest with his leopard skin. You remember when I did Dr. Ben? I tried to simulate some leopard skin over my white robe. So, and here's the priestess with the leopard skin and they're coming to 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 consecrate uh the mummy the symbol of the body having been dead and is now being preserved for posterity and this is another page from the coffin text so we have the pyramid text we got the coffin text um we we've got the book of the coming forth um, this is the 11th hour of the Book of Gates. This is the fourth oldest holy written books. Now, these are all of our holy books written. There is no Bible yet. There is no Torah yet. There is no Koran yet. And here is all of these texts that we have written talking about life, talking about time. If you would account these, you would see we were already into the 24 hours. We were into the 12-hour cycle. We were already into the 365 uh, plus days of the year. We were already studying the stars, studying the relationship between the stars and other things here on earth, studying the relationship between man and energy from around the cosmos, our interrelationship with life and death. We realized that there was no such thing as death, that we both matter and energy and neither can be destroyed. We knew that way back then. We knew that when we had our babies that we did not have babies we simply recreated ourselves as an extension of ourselves so each child that comes out of a human being is that human being deposited themselves into the future that's our culture again and from the book of gates another page i just want to show we had these books another the second from the book of gates i'm not going to go into the detail and this, when we talk about the primordial waters of Nun, they use this symbol um, of a human being as water to symbolize the waters of Nun. The waters of Nun is, is, uh, is that thing out of which all things come into being. And in the book of the coming forth by day, our God creator force said, and having created everything in the world and having then um, 
deposited myself in everything, I then realized that I came forth from my mother, Nun. So the African Amun and Atum and Atum Re says that they came forth from a woman and that the woman or the feminine element in nature was the ultimate deity. I didn't say that. Our ancestors say that there's no book older on this subject than that. God Amun, the hidden one. There was no God looking like this that had this little gold crown on. This is the conception of the mind of an African. If God was a human being, this is the way God would look, like them, okay? So this is the African projecting God in their image. So they said if God Amun was to be on earth as a human, this is the way God Amun would look. Awesome. And another uh, golden statue of the God Amun. God, what they call the, and I have the Antiar, that's Kut, Antiar, the Netter, which we call God, Netter, God, uh, represent the darkness. Now, Kut was the opposite of boundless. Now, so, in, and these are just concepts in the character and the essence and nature of what we would call divinity. So first we know the, the divinity was in what we call darkness. And then we know that the divinity was boundless. It has no beginning. It has no end. It didn't start anywhere. It isn't going to end anywhere. So net, kut, and net, and, uh, and kut, and, and, and um, the, this net, the, the boundless, was, the, was two of the most powerful elements of the divine as we thought them out. And this is the symbol of light. Ra, you know, represented by a human with a falcon head with the sun on top. But on top, the sun is surrounded by a snake that, that has called itself in a circle, represent 360 degrees or infinity, meaning there is no beginning, there is no end. Is sun or heru? No, this, this, this is Heru, heru Ra. Right, right. Okay, when you see this is Ra. So this is the symbol. The falcon is used because the falcon was a bird that can fly up into the sky and it looked like it just disappeared into the sun. It looked like it just disappeared into the sun. And the sun represented the source of an energy without which we would all die. So they were the symbols of the great divinity. And of course, this is the god Ptah. I love Ptah because his skin is always black. He got his little afro hanging up there and, he, and he's my man. And Ptah is the architect of the universe. He represents the primordial hill, the matter, the things we use to build all the things that we build. So if you find in Freemasonry, they will always refer to secretly Ptah, but in the open they call it the great architect of the universe. But once you get into the secrets, they'll tell you that this is Ptah. And all they're doing is talking about the concept of what is necessary to build that which will sustain the human family in an orderly way, in a civilized way, so that they can recreate themselves for posterity and for eternity. And this is a symbol of Shu and Tefnut. Shu represent air, which is a, a brother sitting on the throne with a feather, almost like Ma'at. And then Tefnut, who is a sister, symbolized by a lion with the energy and the power of Ra on her head. And so Shu and Tefnut, air and moisture, would then produce the earth. You know, the, uh, to, again, this is uh, Tefnut, which is moisture and the wife of Shu. And they would produce they, Geb and Nut. Um, they would produce, Geb, this should be reversed. Geb should be the earth and Nut should be the sky. So that's my bad. Um, but remember, Geb is the earth. All the minerals, zinc. Iron, uh, cobalt, all of the diamonds that go, all the silver, all the minerals that's in this earth is in the human body. You know, we're made up of all those minerals. And then the energy from all the stars in the skies and the sun is in our body. And we made up of those, in, those, those the energy and those minerals make, give us life. Before you go on. Yes. So, family, let's correct it. Like, yeah. So, the brother will tell you. Reverse it. Yeah. Gab. Is at earth the and Newt is at the, the top. top. So right, so y'all don't say, brothers. Earlier, yeah. We only hear, we 
we right. made mistakes, but we <laughs> so, correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And this one, now we get into the concepts, principles, and ideas that we are familiar, more familiar with. And the first Madonna and child worship along the Nile, Aset, the Holy Mother, and Haru, the child born of Immaculate Conception, to Asar, the divinity. And you see sisters sitting with her breast in her hand where she's giving nutrient and nurturing to the child. And the third piece of this is the father who is Asar. And that's why I'm saying the symbol of our divinity is the mother, child, father, or the mother, father, child. And it is this symbol that will become throughout the Western world the Mary Jesus symbol, the, the Madonna child symbol. And they will not make any reference back to this African symbol, which is a hundred and hundreds of thousands of years older than them. Matter of fact, on the 11th of September every year, this concept is celebrated in Ethiopia as the Ethiopian New Year. It is the biggest celebration in Ethiopia. And this is Asar. Look at him. This is the way we carved them back in the day. We knew we was black, so our God could only be black. This is the way we saw Asar looking. And he's carrying the shepherd's staff that later Christ would carry because this would become the Christ character in the Christian tradition. And this obelisk, which we see in Washington, D.C., a copy of it in Washington, D.C., is the symbol of this Tekanu, which in our metaphor, when he was killed and lost his capacity to produce, that woman was able to cause him to get a hard on like granite stone. And he then was able to reproduce God itself. So it is saying that we, we never die. This is about no death no death and that all of what we call death is simply uh, uh, a spirit in transition always resurrecting itself and this became the ultimate symbol of that resurrection and of course I love this one because it's the 12 divine disciples of God on earth or the original 12 disciples known as the Netaru so before the, they took our symbols of Aset and Asar, Mary and Jesus, I mean Aset and Haru, Mary and Jesus, and then Asar as the Christ adult. Then they gave him 12 disciples. Well, before that, we had the 12 disciples. Haru, Set, Thor, Kanum, Hathor, Sebek, Ra, um, Amun, Ptah, um, Anubis, Asir, and Aset. So here is the 12 disciples. And, and, and when you look at the, at the name of the 12 that they ascribe in their metaphor, because the story of Jesus is not a true story. That's a metaphor, a European Western metaphor based on your metaphor. This is us trying to explain nature to ourselves and how it functions in the laws. And each of these 12 qualities and attributes or multiple sets of quality and attributes in each one is present in the human character as a possibility of human development. And if you understand that that's what religion and spirituality is supposed to do, is give you the tool to develop within your character any one of these multiple strengths that we call the netters. And they call disciples. The ancient Egyptians, of course, were black. And I put this picture up there because it's so beautiful um, with this sister with her locks. And they weren't called dreadlocks. Dread is a British word. The British didn't exist yet. The English language didn't exist yet. So they couldn't have been called dreadlock. Dread is a British word that means fear. And in Jamaica, where they encountered in other parts of the Caribbean, the priest class that was waging war of independence out of slavery, they all wore their hair in locks then as they do in Africa today. And the British said, we dread the lock-haired ones. And from that, we got the dreadlocks. You know, but it was the white man saying, we dread the lock-haired ones. But you can see the lock-haired ones was there from the beginning of time. And of course, we didn't have no comb or brush. The hair would naturally dread or lock. Sorry, see how I made the same mistake? <laughs> so, now this is a painting from the tomb of Ramses III, 1200 BCE. It shows that the Egyptian perceived themselves as black and represented themselves as such without possible confusion with the Indo-European and the Semites. This is a representation 
of the races in minute detail, which guarantees the realism of the colors throughout the entire history, the Egyptian never dreamt of representing themselves by type B or D. This is B, the Asiatic type, and, and, and D, the, the, so, the European type. And this comes from the book by Shek Diop, Civilization of Barbarism, by Shek Diop on page 66. So the Egyptians saw themselves as black, and this is on the wall of the tomb. And they saw the rest of the Africans looking just like them and it was just as them. They saw the Asiatic type or the Eurasian type looking like this. And they saw the European type looking like this. And they painted on the walls. And they left it there to this day. So let's not be confused anymore wondering who was who and what was what.